wrote everything down, so if it looks like I'm reading, I'm sorry. I'm not super performative. I am reading, but I'm going to try to make it interesting. <laughs> I hope you find it interesting. So hello, my name is Casey Chanbrosi, and I'm a graduate student assistant director for the University Writing Center at IUPUI. Today I'm here to speak to you about a topic that was inspired by a conversation between a consultant and I about our liberal arts degrees on my first day at IUPUI's Writing Center. I had made a joke that I'm sure we've all made about the frailty of my liberal arts degree. No. I told her that my husband had recently finished his degree in electrical engineering. He hadn't done any extracurriculars in college, hadn't played any sports or held any internships, and he had started working at his dream job right out of college. No. I, on the other hand, was beginning to wear down from the horror stories of my field. A, liter a literature graduate from IU working long, late hours as a movie theater manager. A starving artist selling out to write ad slogans. An English teacher met with the reality of being underpaid and overworked. I was afraid, I realized, that I'd done all of this work for my love of it and would still come up fruitless. Though I had spent time in college chasing every opportunity to make myself a competitive job candidate, four years in writing centers, four conferences presented at, two internships, and community service, as I neared the completion of my bachelor's in English, the pressure of what to do next settled in. Every time I talked about the degree I'd worked so hard to earn, I felt some inherent need to explain why so as to add value to my supposedly sloppy career choice. And that's why I found myself here again, making self-deprecating quips about how that's just what I get for studying English. It was this conversation that led me to begin to really question the stories that we tell about ourselves and how the way in which we tell these stories perpetuates this image of who we are. Change. <laughs> When I started graduate school last semester, my fear of being jobless was at its peak. I was working at the University Writing Center, but we had not yet come to an agreement about the compensation for that work. I was insistent that I needed full tuition remission included with my pay in order to stay, and I was hellbent on proving that I, personally, was so necessary to this writing center that by the time fall started, they would need to create an assistantship to avoid losing me. I needed to construct this perception of myself as passionate, hardworking, and studious. Whenever I had downtime, as the semester began, which was often those first few weeks, I picked up a book with a cool sounding name and I devoured it. And that is how fate allowed me to stumble across Peripheral Visions for Writing Centers by Jackie Grush McKinney. In Peripheral Visions, McKinney discusses what her immediate response is when she is asked to talk about what happens in a writing center and what she does as a director. She says she responds with something along the lines of, the writing center is a place for all students to get feedback on their writing and I supervise the tutors. McKinney goes on to discuss how writing centers have a narrative pattern shared by those inside and outside of the center. Writing centers are comfortable, iconoclastic places where all students go to get one-to-one -one tutoring on their writing. Simple. This definition unites us, and it is true, and we have no intention of arguing that it is not. This, the issue that arises, however, is that writing center work is far from simple. Writing center work is extremely complex. McKinney addresses an inconsistency in the shared narrative, calling it a cognitive dissonance between the work we do and the work we talk about. We know writing center administrators don't just supervise tutors. If I didn't know this before, I personally have been made abundantly aware of this fact since I became a GSA in August. The work is exhausting, and it is just so much. Yet, each time we are asked what we do in writing centers or what we do as administrators, we respond with this shared narrative over and over again because it is the familiar story we have always been telling. And when we are stopped in the hallway, zombie walking to lunch at 2 p.m., or trying to explain to our great-grandparents over screaming kids at Thanksgiving dinner what we do for a living, we know that they don't want to hear, nor do we want to explain the enormous list of things we do. We don't tell them that the list of things that we do looks like this, which includes tasks such as answering questions about commas while walking past a session, Sharing the secret to good writing in under an hour. And writing memos, articulating the need for more space, better equipment, more bodies. Oh, and this, reading the latest publications, troubleshooting everything, and worrying about what is not getting done. Day in and day out, every single day. So, as I'm looking at this list that McKinney has spelled out for us about the work we are all doing, and I'm thinking about what people think we are actually doing, it kind of reminded me of something. First, it reminded me of being a college student in English. Our shared narrative could be a person who studies English. 
But then it reminded me of one of the identities which has opened my eyes to the narrative surrounding women in our society. This narrative that we construct, that is so often understated, reminded me of what it felt like to be a mother. McKinney herself does mention that part of the narrative we create implicates us writing center directors as mothers. Not us, I'm not a writing center director, I'm not. But the important thing that McKinney wants us to take away from this is that the effect of a shared narrative can leave us with this collective tunnel vision, focusing our attention so narrowly that we no longer see the range and variety of what we do and how we can evolve. In its simplest form, the narrative that society has assigned to mothers is that they are women with children who do nurturing work. Whenever we lean back into this narrative, because it is quick and it is familiar, we perpetuate that image of ourselves. In doing so, we neglect the identities of those who might identify as mothers, but who are not women, or those who identify as mothers, but do not do the stereotypical nurturing work. Further, we leave parts of what we do open to interpretation based on the assumed knowledge of the person we share this narrative with. When I use a simplified shared narrative to explain what I do as an English major and in the writing center, people fill in those gaps with what they understand. They associate the words English and writing with grammar and make assumptions that I work with grammar all day. And when I do not challenge the shared narrative of a mother, I leave out that I am also a graduate student in English uh, with all of the complexities and nuances of that narrative that I work a very challenging job. And as a result, I sometimes have to prioritize other things over my nurturing work. And it leaves out that I have no intention of changing your baby's diaper because you assume that that's all I do all day, so I must be waiting around to make myself useful. McKinney tells us that we have to become more aware of the story we are not allowing when we tell the stories that we tell. So the thing I want to discuss that we are leaving out when we talk about writing centers is that writing centers are feminine. Melissa Nicholas states that because of this narrative, because this narrative of feminization is implicit, there is no real agreement about what it means to call the writing center a feminized space. For some, the term feminized is equated to the biological sex of the staff and clients. For others, feminized means the writing center is a space where feminist ideology and pedagogy get put into practice. While for still others, the term feminized signifies writing center's marginalized space in English departments in particular, and the academy in general. I'm going to use a disclaimer from Nicholas here. Uh, I want to emphasize that I am talking about the writing center administrator position and not the writing center administrator as a person. Specific writing center directors may be greatly valued and respected at their institutions for the work they do and the people they are. But here I want to talk about the rule, not the exception. Nicholas discusses the unofficial rhetoric contributing to the marginalization and feminization of writing center positions with a story about how she had to convince an institution that she was not some literature scholar in disguise and did not want to move out of the center and up the ladder of respect. The top of that ladder is a tenure land position because tenure indicates a recognition of academic pursuit. But according to Nicholas, since less than 50% of directors are tenured because writing center work is work is not considered a real intellectual pursuit. As a result, writing center directors do not get access to that power and respect. Sue Ellen Holbrooks states that composition work is feminine because it exhibits four characteristics of women's work, being that it is undervalued, undercompensated, service-oriented, and employs a disproportionate number of women. Yet regardless of these correlations and the sheer number of women in the field, the conversations that take place about writing center work do not pay attention to gender politics. The less attention we pay to this fact, the more writing centers lose their own agency in changing the way our narrative affects our circumstances. Writing centers are a microsite where this macro institutional issue is manifesting. And referring back to motherhood, which in itself is an identity to which not all women identify, but is certainly a position that is perceived by a constructed narrative of what is feminine. Writing centers, like mothers, must maintain a multidimensional identity. Michelle Miley states that feminist mothering does not restrict or reduce a woman's identity and purpose solely to motherhood. Mothers must navigate between professional wives and children. Amber Kistner calls this inherent tension of, mother, of a mother who has relationships with other people than her children relating in multiplicity. Writing center directors must also balance relationships and identities. They work within the center, but to empower our work as intellectual, valuable work within the institution, they must also relate in multiplicity and insist on research and other relationships that make the intellectual work of the director and of the writing center more visible. 
Now, obviously, we aren't the only field that maintains a shared grand narrative. So why is it that our narrative is less productive than other fields? Part of this is because the university itself is a patriarchal culture and as a result tends to be driven towards a production model. This works out well for science-based fields because they produce tangible products that like medicines and technologies. However, we tend to value the process of creating those products less because we are less comfortable with the language of those processes. According to Muriel Harris, we tend to toss up our hands at those areas of study that we might consider esoteric in our minds. And when those products are created, they become an unspoken part of that narrative. For example, if the narrative of doctors is doctors heal people, we inherently know that doctors heal people with medicine, the product of medical sciences. Liberal arts fields, on the other hand, tend to be driven by the process rather than the product. And since everyone writes and speaks and scribbles from time to time, everyone assumes some insight knowledge, making the language of the field more accessible to the public but also subject to a simplistic level of awareness. And when a product is created, its value, as demonstrated by Robert Scholl's English apparatus, which places the consumption of literature over the production of it, tends to be whether that art is placed back into the canon of our base work that will be used to continue this process. So it's not measurable. <laughs> and if our focus in the writing center narrative is only on measuring our consultant's success in one-to-one -one consulting, that work also cannot easily be measured because there are many other facets involved in developing a student's writing, and a student's writing cannot easily be measured for individual qualities or improvements. Since we are the experts in our field and our story, the responsibility falls on us to complicate that story, and it is also our responsibility to make sure that we are being seen for the things we are doing. Our research, for example, are the professional skills we teach our consultants over time in the center. Now there is a lot of debate about what we do with this narrative. Some scholars suggest that we be more careful in the way we frame ourselves so as to avoid association with the feminine traits and marginalization because it can leave us vulnerable to uncertain budget cuts, staffing, and locations, but also to misunderstandings. Others ask us to embrace our feminization and even in some ways our marginalization, citing that our strength is that we exist in the margins. Personally, when I was confronted with this reality, I had two reactions. First one, why don't we just change the wording that we use to talk about writing centers to masculine terminology with numbers and stuff? Problem solved. Mm -hmm. And the second one, did I really just decide the best course of action was to stop insulting my field by separating it from my sex? It was quite eye-opening to recognize how much I had accepted this inherent hatred of myself. So I decided, screw that, and finished with letting my own identity be used to oppress my job. Miley suggests that our insistence that we be recognized as feminized speaks to our feelings of degradation and goes as far as to say we have a duty to begin considering the ways the feminization narrative affects all levels of our writing center work and that we even go past that and reject devaluation of our feminine practices, empower our nurturing work, and resist the silencing of feminine traits in the production model of the neoliberal institution. This has raised the stakes for me and for my work in the writing center. Yes, the blows sometimes hit harder. Sometimes when my grant requests are denied, I recognize that in some way it is because I operate within a culture that does not value those traits of the writing center that are what make me, me. But when they are successful, it's a step forward for me and for women as well. A reassurance that being a woman can be valued for the right reasons if we keep fighting for it. I embrace this narrative because it adds fuel to my fire. Nicholas suggests we embrace it as well by asking ourselves four questions. How do we counter the effects of the story of writing centers that have already been told in ways to challenge its marginal position while at the same time who we are? Is it possible to remain a feminized site without maintaining a marginalized position? Is it possible to remove marginalization as part of this coding? And in what ways are writing center scholars and practitioners complicit in our marginalization? According to Miley, on the timeline of academia, writing centers are now in the fortunate position of coming into adulthood, and therefore they have the opportunity to revise the scripts that have coded them as fairy tale heroines. Nicholas then suggests that we need to actively dictate the conditions of our generation of work. We need to move our perceptions from feminized to feminist. So I want to leave you with a quote from Cheryl Strait's Wild, which I'm reading right now. It's amazing. 
I knew that if I allowed fear to overtake me, my journey was doomed. Fear, to a great extent, is born of a story we tell ourselves. And so I chose to tell myself a different story from the one women are told. I decided I was safe, I was strong, I was brave, nothing could vanquish me. Fear begets fear, power begets power. I will myself to beget power. So beget power. This is our field and it is our responsibility to change the way we are seen by first changing the way we see ourselves. In marketing, you are taught how to convince customers that they need the thing you are selling. But we are already needed. Returning to the story of my husband getting a job straight out of college, nobody talks about the few months that he wasn't getting callbacks before I worked with him to perfect his resume. <laughs> so start talking. Start telling that story. And lastly, be prepared for those students who come to you asking about their future in the field. Stop telling them that they shouldn't do it because it's too hard. Be realistic, yes. Be honest about your struggles. And then be prepared to help them figure out those with, figure them out from the experiences you've learned from. You did it, right? You are here. The only difference between you and them is a handful of years and experiences that you are denying them when you shut down their dreams. We want this next generation of writing center administrators to be the ones that are passionate about writing center work, not some literature majors in disguise. I am still here for one reason, because I am very stubborn. And while that has certainly served me well, trust me, you do not want a field full of stubborn people like me someday. My skin is thick, but half of the work of writing centers is the emotional labor, labor that I struggle to provide. Stop this self-deprecating rhetoric and start challenging it. Change it now so the next generation of administrators might come into a place of more strength than the one you first entered into. Will yourselves to beget power. <laughs>